interesting. Actually, I learned about it in the academy. And uh, I quit the full-time force in 2000 when I started the online trading expo. So maybe a few of you have been to the online trading expo. Got another one coming up uh, in, well, next weekend now in New York City. Thankfully, we missed the storm by uh, a week. Uh, but I'm still a reserve officer, which means I'm still a cop in L.A. In fact, I'm going to work a shift, a 12-hour shift. Right after I'm done with this, I'm jumping out of here and going up to L.A. and see if we can't find that, that uh, bad guy that's on the loose out there. Um, so I still um, work a shift in a black and white with a partner about every other week just to uh, have a relaxing time away from trading. And uh, honestly, it, it truly is uh, <laughs> a relaxing time. After trading all day, um, going to chase bad guys is, is kind of different because I have to take my mind off of trading and take my mind uh, and put it completely on um, my tactics in the patrol. So um, let's see. Let's start out. Here's what I've been doing. I've been doing over the past few years at TraderInterviews.com. I've been talking to a bunch of wealthy traders. And I put together a list a while back of things that I hear the wealthiest traders say over and over again. After you talk to a lot of traders, you find out that a lot of them start to say similar things. And I started to make notes of these things that people are saying to me over and over again. Because when I hear them over and over again, and these guys are making huge amounts of money, I pay attention to that. Because if they're doing it, that's probably something that I need to be aware of as well. Now, some of these things are going to be obvious to you. I try to stay away from the whole make sure you set your stops and keep them and all that stuff. I try to put together a list that's a little bit different than that, although some of them will be familiar to you, obvious to you. And I'm hoping that if you get one or two things out of these habits that make sense to you, that you add to your own trading, then we'll have been, I'll have been successful here. So some of them may be obvious. Other ones, you'd be like, wow, you know what? I never really thought of it that way before. Um, and so... Hopefully that you'll do that. So let's just jump right into this, and uh, let's talk about these 20 habits. Actually, I think there's 30 here. Number one, wealthy traders are patient with winning trades and enormously impatient with losing trades. And if you think about this, the, the, the vast majority of newer traders, I know I was, do exactly the opposite of this. This is straight out of the mouth of Dennis Gartman. Um, Dennis is a, a trader, a hedge fund manager, and you'll see him on CNBC occasionally. Wealthy traders flip that on its head. What you would do when you normally start trading is you get into a trade and it starts to go against you and you think, you know what, mm, I'm going to let this go just a little bit longer. I'm going to be patient with this. I know I'm right about this. And when things are starting to go in your favor and you're making money, you immediately start going, you know what, ooh, ooh, I better get out of this. I better bring my stop up to break even. I better, I better uh, be impatient. I don't want this to turn into a loss. Wealthy traders do exactly the opposite of that. They do... They are extremely patient with their winners. They let their winners run, but it's more than that. They're patient with them. They don't get freaked out when things start to, when you know, it, start, it upticks and then it ticks down a little bit and then goes back up again. They're patient with their winners, enormously impatient with their losers. Most traders do the exact opposite, and that's why most traders lose money. If all you do is this, patient with winners, impatient with losers, you're way ahead of the game. Number two. Wealthy traders realize that making money is more important than being right. We all want to be right about our trading. We all want to be right about our decisions. Like, I, I'm a good decision maker. I'm going to be right in this market. You can try to force your thoughts and force your opinions of being right on the market all day long, and they will just spank you every single time. So that's how they can be impatient with their losers and patient with their winners. They're not trying to be right. They're not trying to make a right decision. They're trying to make money in the markets. So if you get spanked in the market yourself five times in a row and that frustrates you because, darn it, you know, I know I'm right about this. I'm stopped out and my trade immediately goes in the direction I thought it was going to be. Try to settle down. Be calm with that. It's not about being right in the market. It's about making money. And if that means you're doing something wrong, and you can't let your ego get in the way and not flip-flop that right away. Your job is to make money. So you need to be on whatever side the market says you need to be on. Don't you tell the market what side to be on. Let the market tell you to be what side on, to be what, what side to be on. There's another couple of slides here that are going to kind of build on that. So and let me just stop here and say that I'm still perfecting this 
presentation in terms of understanding the 20 things that traders do that are very good in this market. Some of them I'm really good at explaining. Some of them I'm not very good at explaining, but I'm getting better. So slide number 17 has always been a problem for me. We'll get there, and I'll try to explain it as best I can. Number three, wealthy traders look at technical analysis as a picture of where traders are lining up to buy and sell. Most of us look at charts and we say, here's a support, a support area, here's a resistance area, which is technically correct. But what does that really mean? Why is it support and resistance? It's not just because that's a line on the chart and that's where it says it's supposed to be. Wealthy traders don't see it as support and resistance. They see it as there are traders lining up to buy here and there are traders lining up to sell right here. They almost look at a chart and they see people. They see emotions. They see, okay, I know that there are a lot of traders lining up and got their stops right here. Why do you think you get stopped out all the time and then your trader immediately flips around and goes the other way? Why do you think that is? It's not because they know that you're in the market. They know that there's a bunch of you in the market right there. And the professional traders see you there and they go down and wipe you out and then turn it around and bring it right back up. That's exactly what's happening. You need to start looking at the charts at places where traders are lining up to buy and sell. That's the reason something is support and resistance, not just because it's a price level here and it hasn't risen above that price level. It's because everybody's looking at that price level. So wealthy traders look at it as here's where the people that I'm going to take my money from today are sitting. That's exactly it. It's, it's, uh, it's not a pleasant to think about that, really, but if you start thinking that same way, you can be on the same side as those traders. Number four, before they enter any trade, they know exactly where they will exit for either a gain or a loss. You should know exactly where you're going to get in and get out before you enter the trade. I don't know of any wealthy trader that doesn't know where their stop is going to be or where they may exit a position, and they don't know generally where the level is where they're going to exit on, as a profit as well. They know both of those levels. If you don't have one of those pieces of information before you hit the buy button, stop. You need to know. Even if it's just a profit target because you're buying a 52-week high and it hasn't been above this level in a long time, have a general idea of where you're going to exit either way. That way there's no question and there's no disagreement in your own mind about where that's going to happen down the road. Okay? Know that it is what those numbers are before you get into a trade. Wealthy traders do. And by the way, if uh, you can't see the slides for some reason, you know this will be recorded, and uh, you can see that presentation anytime. So um, you will get this. Don't worry about that. Um, but I don't show any charts in my presentation. Well, I show one, but it's a, as an example. So um, even if you have just the audio, you'll be good to go. Number five, they approach trade number five with the exact same mindset they did on the four previous losing trades. This goes back to having confidence in your system. It's not blind confidence in that I'm just going to trade my system no matter what. If I lose 60 times in a row, man, I know my system's right and I'm going to keep trading it. No. But statistically, it's very possible for most trading systems and most even discretionary ideas to be wrong four times in a row. It is absolutely statistically relevant for that to happen. The trouble is, is that most of us, after we have those four losing trades in a row, we get that fifth signal and we see that fifth setup that we know matches our criteria. And what do we do? Ooh, you know what? I've got the four last trades I've lost on. I think I'm going to sit this fifth trade out. And what happens? That fifth trade inevitably is the most beautiful trade of the day, works its way, would have wiped out the losses of all the four previous trades, plus makes you a couple grand every, you know, on that next trade. So unless something has changed in the market. Unless the market is telling you that something has changed and you need to reevaluate your ideas, take that fifth trade with as much gusto and enthusiasm as you had the first four trades that you lost on. Okay? Now, this is, again, not being blind about it. It's just a matter of making sure that you understand that there will be times when you lose four times in a row. And as long as you keep your stops tight and you are those stops are matched with your level of risk tolerance, and you're not risking more than you're supposed to based on your trading plan, which everybody should have, take that fifth trade. The wealthy traders do because the fifth trade, of course, is always the one that works out when we don't take it, right? That's just the nature of the markets. Number six, they use naked charts and focus on zones. So let me go to this next slide. It's my only chart, and it's not really a chart. When I first started trading, we all do this. I put on ARCs, Fibonacci, 
support and resistance, median lines, pitchforks. I can barely see the damn price bars anymore. I, I don't even know where this is. This is, you know, I think on the right there's a red bar over there. The trouble is, is that the more information you put on a chart, the more difficult it is to find confirmation of anything. Most traders go through this, this, this evolution where they start with a plain chart, they start adding something on top, something on top of that, something on top of that. Pretty soon your chart looks like this with a whole bunch of gobbledygook that you can't even see price anymore. And price is what matters. So eventually they start peeling stuff off. They peel off the Fibonacci. They peel off the median lines. And they have one thing. And they watch that one thing for a while. And then they realize, you know what? Here's something that's working for me. Let's just use that one thing. So all of the wealthy traders I've talked to, almost to a T, they look at price and volume. That is it. Price and volume. They may look at price and volume at different price levels, like how much, how many trades came in at this price, how many trades at this price. So they may use one, every, uh, other, one other thing. They might throw a moving average on there just to get an idea of, whoa, there we go. Thank you. They might throw a moving average on there just to see an idea of where price has been and where it's going. But understand that you've got to start peeling things off and just looking at price and price levels. That's really what's important. So, and they don't think of the Fibonacci, the 618. How often have you seen something bounce off a of 618 to a tick? Very rarely. Sometimes it'll come just, bare, just shy of the line coming up. Sometimes it'll go past the line and then back down if it's, you're looking at a, a resistance level. They don't see the 618 line as a perfect line where price is going to hit. They see it as a zone. Somewhere in this area, something may change. I need to be aware of the zone around the 618. Okay, I would love it if it always hit it to the tick and then reversed immediately. That's just not the way it happens. So, and you can't see that unless you've got a clear picture of where price is. So, use naked charts, pull things off, test things one at a time. If you put five things on there and you have to wait for all five things to happen, you'll take one trade a year, and even then it may not be the right kind of trade. Number seven, they realized a long time ago that being uncomfortable trading is okay. We all want to get to this point where we sit down in our chair at our desk and we feel awesome about our trading. We know what we're doing. We've studied every method there is. We know all the technical analysis. We've, take, we've studied all the courses. We've read all the books. And we feel like now I'm going to be totally comfortable. I'm going to make money on a consistent basis. We all work toward that. But the funny thing is, is that I talked to a lot of wealthy traders who said, look, when I sit down in my chair in the morning to go look at the market, I'm a little uneasy. I feel a little uneasy about every piece uh, or every trade I take. I, I, I thought at some point I would get to a point where I would be totally confident and at ease trading. It never came. So what you have to do is understand that you have to be okay being uncomfortable. It's okay to be sitting in your trading chair and being uncomfortable placing those trades. But you have to be able to make good decisions in spite of being uncomfortable. There is a good video. Uh, if you sign up for my free mailing list at TraderInterviews.com, a little subtle pitch there. There's a good video that I call it's the best video about trading that's not about trading. And it's about a uh, Evan Longoria of the Tampa Bay Rays talking about how he is still uncomfortable. This guy is a, who's an all-star and a batting champion is still uncomfortable every time he steps up to the plate. That there's this little this level of uneasiness that he thought he would get to the point where he could step up and go, okay, bring it, and just take a swing and be okay with that. He's uncomfortable at the plate all the time, but he's able to make good decisions about which balls to, to swing at in spite of that uncomfortableness. So being comfortable, being uncomfortable. Wealthy traders do it. Number eight, the markets they trade fit their personality. They are a participant, not an onlooker. So this is a little more of a nebulous one. I'll try to explain it as best I can. We all hear about, well, I need to be trading the market that kind of fits my personality as, as a person. I don't want to trade something that goes too quickly if I'm a more of a slower, you know, introverted trader. So that's true, but it's more than that. After a while, wealthy traders don't feel like they're just an onlooker trying to get some scraps out of the market while the big boys are out there doing their thing. I think we all feel like that, like, I'm, I, do I, I'm not really knowing what I'm doing here. I'm kind of playing in somebody else's playground. Wealthy traders, after a certain point, feel like, this is my backyard. This is what I do. And I feel like I am a market participant as much as anybody huge head fund trader out there. I am 
as much of a player in this market as anybody else. So you've got to get to the point where you feel like you're not an onlooker just trying to try to make some money here. You feel confident enough that you are a participant in this market as, as much as, as a market maker or a floor trader as anybody else, that you belong here. I know that's a little touchy-feely nebulous, but it's, it's something I hear a lot from the traders that I talk to. Number nine, they stopped trying to pick tops and bottoms long ago and stopped losing money. Now, I get a lot of feedback on this, these, these 20 habits, and sometimes it's negative feedback. And I get a lot of negative feedback about this one. I get somebody who will email me inevitably after every presentation and say, look, I make all my money picking the tops and bottoms. And I've, I've interviewed tra traders that, that do that. The trouble is, is that is a really tough skill to do. And the, re the way that what I tell people is, look, look at any chart. Pick up and pull up a chart, a six-month chart, a daily chart, whatever you want to pick, and draw lines on the uh, where price turns. Where price turns, if you draw a line to the left of it, to the right of it. And you'll see that 80% of the chart is where something is trending. It's not turning. So they stop trying to pick out the 20% of the chart to make money on and tar start looking at the 80% of the chart where it's not turning and make money there. Picking a top and bottom is really hard, very hard to do. I've seen traders that can do it. I can't do it, and most traders I talk to can't do it. So they try to get the meat of the move. Okay. So stop trying to pick your tops and bottoms. Get the meat of the move between those things, and you're in a much better position to make money. The, the kind of corollary to this that I tell people, when somebody emails me and they say, Tim, look, I've listened to a bunch of the interviews. I still can't make money. I can't replicate this. I'm trying all kinds of things. I'm having a tough time making money consistently. And all I tell them is, look, what I've told people that seems to work and what I do for myself when I'm having a really tough time, all I do is I buy 52-week highs and I sell 52-week lows. That's it. That's my strategy. Most people think, well, why are you doing that? You're buying at the top and selling at the low. Well, Guess what? There's a reason those have gotten to those places, and they're likely to continue in that direction. Are you wrong still? Of course you're still wrong on some of those trades. But if you're having a tough time making money, and all you do is buy 52-week highs and sell 52-week lows, I guarantee you, you're going to see some success. Okay? Because what you're doing is you're buying into an existing trend. You're not trying to pick the top or the bottom. Number 10, they stopped thinking about the market being cheap or expensive. I want you to eliminate the words cheap and expensive from your trading. Nothing is cheap and nothing is expensive. That 25 cent option that you can buy a thousand contracts of because it's a week out and it's out of the money, but you think it might make some money because the maximum loss is 25 cents. If it goes to zero, is that more expensive than Google that, that goes up 25 cents at 650 or 700 or 710? Wealthy traders don't think of the market as cheap or inexpensive. Okay. Apple is not cheap or expensive right now. What is it? Still $400 some dollars, $462, whatever it is. If is $500 oil expensive? Not if somebody's willing to pay $505 10 minutes from now. Is a 25 cent option cheap? Not if it's at 15 cents an hour from now. All wealthy traders think about is is somebody going to pay more or less for this in an hour, in a day, in a month? That's all they care about. It's not about being cheap or expensive. We don't know. We don't know all that's involved in the pricing of what that goes into that. But is somebody willing to pay more or less for it later? That's all that matters. Okay. So no more cheaper or, ex or expensive. I want you to think of it is as payment. Who's going to pay more for this? Who's going to pay less for this in an hour, in a day, whatever your time frame may be. Number eleven. They are willing to change sides, short to long, and vice versa when the markets tell them to do so. This is about not being right. They don't care about being right. If they get up with a bias in the morning that things are going to be a long day, that they're going to be going long, and the market starts to tank, they will flip sides. They will flip sides in that war in a heartbeat. They are not on anybody's side. They are on the side of making money. And if that means their initial bias was wrong, they will flip-flop in a heartbeat. And it may have no qualms about it. So be willing to do and trade in the way that the market tells you. Not that the way you think it should be. You can be wrong all day long. We've all heard that old, ad, old adage, the, wrong, the market can be wrong longer than you can stay solvent. And that is so true. It will prove you wrong day after day after day. It tells you what to trade, not the other way around. Turn my cell phone off here.
All right, number 12. They trade aggressively when trading well and modestly when they are not. Most traders, I'm afraid to say, do the exact opposite. When they have a couple of losing trades in a row, they double their size to try and make it up. And when they're, when they're winning, they take back. They're afraid to, to, to put on size because they don't want to have that profit turn into a loss. I can tell you right now that wealthy traders, when they are trading well, they can pile on size faster. I mean, they pile on enormous size, size that would make me just my gut wrench. But when they're trading well and they're viewing the market well, that's the time to make their money. That's the time to really get in there. When they're not trading well and they've got had a couple of bad days, they pull back. What I've always done, my rule always was, if I had five losing trades in a row, I can only trade a single share until I'm right. That's it. Are you going to get killed on commissions? Absolutely. But I'd rather pay a $12 commission or a $6 commission and get into the, the mode of the market and trade a single share until I can make money price-wise on that single share twice in a row, then I can get back and put on my regular size, 100 shares, 500 shares, 1,000 shares. If you are trading badly, trade a single share until you can trade well again. And yes, you're not going to make any money because you're, going to, you're not going to get, you know, make over more than what the commission is. But the commission is your education. Don't let the huge loss be your education. Okay, it's cheap education. Trade aggressively when you're trading well and back off when you're not. 13, they realize the market will be open again tomorrow. I kicked myself in the butt for like months when I missed that Netflix short. I thought that thing was going to turn around, and it went down like 150 bucks, and I never caught it. And I was like, God, I'm never going to get a chance to trade Netflix again when it goes down that much. It may not be Netflix, but you are going to get another chance. I promise you another opportunity is coming. The market will be open again tomorrow. And, you know, the, the, it's, it's hilarious. When I talk to traders, they're, they get down on themselves more for missing a trade than for a losing trade. How crazy is that? And I've done it too. I, I piss, I'm, I'm more angry about the trade I missed than the trade that I lost 10% on. That's nuts. You should be happy going flat if, if the alternative is losing 10 or 20%, right? The markets will be open again tomorrow. You, you will have another opportunity. I promise you. Don't worry about it. Number 14. They never add to a losing trade. Ever. Now, I get some bad feedback about this, too. I'll inevitably, we'll get somebody who will email me after this presentation. They say, Tim, I, you know, I hear what you're saying, but I got this great martingale strategy where I just double down every time I lose. You will get slaughtered eventually. You may not happen today. It may not happen tomorrow, next month. You will lose your entire account. You will blow up doing that. If all you do is number 14, never add to a losing trade, ever. Yeah, but Tim, nope, 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 nope. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to preface this with one caveat, and I, it, all, it makes me really nervous to do it because it, it gives you an excuse. Okay? The only time a, a wealthy trader, a big trader would do this is if they need to get into a size big, 50,000, 100,000 shares. They can't do it in one trade. They have to go in. So after that first trade goes in, it may tick, tick down a bit. If it hasn't reached the level, like it's still in the price zone that they want to buy within, they will add to that position even though it has gone against them from that first trade. For 99.9% .9 of us, we'll never have to worry about that. So if all you do is just never add to a losing trade, I promise you, you'll be in this game a lot longer. And it will give you time to figure out what works before you blow up your account. Don't ever add to a losing trade. Just don't do it no matter what. 15. Cash is the target, but they set goals for their trading that are anything but money. What does that mean? You know, when I talk to a lot of wealthy traders, they say, uh, you know what? I ask them all the time, how much money do you make? You know, and I hope they don't hang up on me. <laughs> Most of them don't. Um, but they say, well, here's, here's how much money I want to make, but that's not my goal every day. Look, we're all in here to make money. Let's not kid ourselves. We're here to make money, a lot of money, be rich, buy the big house, buy the car we want, have the lifestyle we want, the freedom we want. That's why I'm here, man. I'm not here to, like, to, to, to trade for trading's sake. I'm here to make cash. But the problem with that is, is if you make cash, the end-all, be-all goal of your trading, that goal is going to cloud your judgment. 
if your goal is to make 500 bucks a day, you're going to overtrade when you're trying to make that, when you shouldn't be trading. You're going to make decisions you should not be making in order to get that goal. So what you do instead is, and what the, most of the wealthy traders I've talked to have done is said, look, I have a trading plan, and my goal is to follow that and not be stupid and make bad decisions. That's my goal, is to follow my trading plan to a T, to not make bad decisions. And because I make that the goal, the money will come. But I, I can't focus on money because if I focus on money, I look at the P&L constantly and I will overtrade to, to try and fix it. If I don't, if, I, if my goal is 500 a day and I made 300 yesterday, I'm gonna overtrade to try and make 700 tomorrow. So that money clouds the judgment. You gotta make your goal some other thing that inevitably if you do that, the money comes. That's what you gotta be doing and that's what wealthy traders do. Number 16. They read trading books, but they read more crowd books too. And I put three of them up there for you. The Wisdom of Crowds by James Sirowiecki, very good one. The Art of Strategy is one I finished recently. That's really good as well. And Markets, Mobs, and Mayhem. Why do they read about that? Why do good traders and wealthy traders read about rioting and mobs and mayhem? It's because that's what the markets are. The market is just basically a controlled riot and sometimes not so controlled. It's the psychology of people, fear and greed. You may have heard that. So if you understand the psychology of fear and greed and why that drives price, why supply and demand, which is based on fear and greed, drives price, you're in a much better position to understand why things are doing things, why, why price is doing something it shouldn't be doing. Why is Apple price just getting clobbered right now when they've got hundred gazillion dollars in the bank and their products are still selling well? Okay, understanding the psychology of the market and who's trading, us human beings in the market which drive that price will give you better answers to that. All right, let's moving on to number 17. I actually have 10 bonus uh, habits here too. I'm gonna go through them quickly. Ah, number 17. Oh my goodness, all right. This one is the bane of my presentation, but I'm gonna try to explain it. Wealthy traders provide liquidity to the markets while watching price and volume. No, this is not the one. All right, yes it is. Here, here, there's a couple in a row here that, that are kind of similar. Trade, wealthy traders, when I talk about them being feeling like they're participants in the market and not onlookers, I hear wealthy traders talk about providing liquidity to the market. And I heard them um, more, more than one, I can't remember, see, see, excuse me, I heard them saying this over and over again, and I thought, what do they mean by providing liquidity while watching price and volume? They don't see it as lo going long and short. They talk about providing liquidity. Here's the best way I can explain it. There's two ways I explain this. And I'm still working on this, guys, so forgive me, guys and girls. Forgive me for if this one is not quite there yet. I'm still working on this one. Wealthy traders think of it this way. Picture yourself going into a grocery store. And you walk into the store to get uh, your Yoohoo and uh, donuts or whatever it may be. And you see there are huge lines for 2% milk. Wow, why are there, 2% milk's hot today. This is the hot, you know, trending higher. The milk prices are going higher. Everybody's in line with 2% milk. So the normal trader will go to the back of the store into the refrigerator and buy two gallons of 2% milk and walk up and get in line with the rest of the people. That's not what wealthy traders do. Wealthy traders will walk up to the checkout line and walk up to the checker and say, hey, let me check out some people here with 2% milk for a while. Let me do your job for a while and let me make a market in milk for a little bit. And they start buying and selling milk. They, they, you know, they run the people, the regular traders through their checkout line. They are the checker in the line rather than the customer. I know that's not great. There's something there. I'm still working on it. One more story to explain this a little bit better. Okay. There is always a hot toy at Christmas time where the parents all want the hot toy for their kids. Cabbage Patch dolls, Legos, whatever it may be, whatever the hot toy of, the, of Christmas is. And when parents go out to the store and they go from store to store to store looking for the hot toy. They can't find it. They want to find it. They, you know, they wait in line since 4 a.m. in the morning to go into the toy store and buy this hot toy for their kids so they have it under the tree at Christmas morning. The trader parent doesn't do that. The trader parent says, you know what? The money is, there's money to maybe making a market in that toy. So they do everything they can to go out and get the toy and they immediately put it on eBay for double and make a market in that toy rather than buying it for themselves. 
That's how wealthy traders think of their trading. They think of it as making a market, almost as market makers themselves. They don't think of buying it for themselves for their own portfolio to hold on to it to, to rise in price. They make a market in that. There's something there, folks. I, I'm not exactly sure what it is. I'm still working on that part of it, but there is something there. So keep that in mind. I hope that just kind of triggers you to start thinking of, of the market and when you trade yourself. Number 18, they have a way to gauge fear, greed, and speed of transactions. And one way is a tick chart. So I always hear wealthy traders talking about how they gauge the momentum or speed of the market. And the easiest way to do this, they all have their own. I had one guy that I interviewed a year ago that actually had programmed a bell to ring. And when the market starts to move quickly, the bell rings faster. Ding, 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 ding. Almost like the opening of the stock exchange. That was his audible way to hear. Maybe it's pit noise. Pit noise starts to rise, and that's your way of understanding the volume of the market. The way I do it, I have a single tick chart that I put up in the left-hand corner of my screen that prints a bar every tick. And when the market starts to move faster, the ticks start to go faster, and the bars start to print faster. It's my visual way of kind of seeing that the market is starting to get frothy. It's starting to, to develop. There's, I don't know, pit noise, so this is my way of understanding the the fear, the, the momentum of the market, the things are speeding up and slowing down. So I would suggest put a, a, pick, pick, a tick chart on your, it's an easy way, most every software program has it. Use at least one tick chart, not to trade on, but just to get a good feel for the speed of the market. 19, they practice reading the right side of the chart, not the left. What do I mean by that? We can all see that head and shoulders that was beautiful a month ago in the Russell. We can all see that bear flag two weeks after it printed. whoop de doo you can see. My, you know, my daughter could recognize a head and shoulders on a chart pattern when she was five. That's not where the money's made. I can make no money on that after knowing after the fact. It does me no good. The wealthy traders out there see those patterns as they are happening. And this gets into a little bit of fuzziness in terms of prediction. I'm not telling you they're fortune tellers or they're reading crystal balls. That's not it. But what they've done is they have gotten very good at reading the side of the chart that has nothing in it yet. There are no bars there yet. So what I want you to do to try to practice this a little bit is just look at the bar that has, that has printed most recently and try in your mind to visually predict where the next bar is going to print. It's not about being a fortune teller and reading the future. It's not about that. It's about seeing those patterns as they happen. It's tough to see a bear flag in your mind unless you've practiced seeing, okay, where is this next one going to go? Where's the volume going to be? Start predicting in your mind, where is that visually, where is that next bar going to print? That exercise will help you get into these patterns before they happen, while they're happening, okay? Wealthy, charts do, wealthy traders do it that way. Number 20, every wealthy trader has an edge. If you can't explain to me in an elevator, like I'm a two-year-old, no, that's a little young, like a, like a sixth grader, what your edge in the market is, you don't have one. If you can't explain it to the average person on the street, what your edge is in the market, you don't have one. The only guys that may be the exception to this are the algo traders that are doing high-frequency stuff and are PhDs in computer programming. They probably can't explain their edge. And they wouldn't want to anyway, because that's their IP. But for most of us, you have to be able to explain that. And it, it doesn't have to be anything rocket science. It can be my edge in the market, the thing that I see better than anybody else, is when the five-period moving average crosses above the 10. That's my thing. I don't know why I can read that well. I can tell when, what's going to happen when that happens. It doesn't have to be complicated. It can be very simple. But you have to have an edge. It's probably not going to be moving average crossovers. Okay. But it's got to be something where you feel like you have an advantage, like you see this happening. And for whatever reason, it makes sense to you. So you've got to have that edge. If you, if you don't have an edge, you're just guessing. And guessing is not a trading strategy. 21, their position size is calculated exactly on risk tolerance. I have never he heard a wealthy, successful trader tell me that my position size is 1,000 shares. I've never heard it. And in fact, when I ask wealthy traders, so what's your normal position size? There's a silence on the line. And, and then the next thing they say is, Tim, that's the stupidest question that anybody's asked me this month. That's a, what are you talking about? I need to know what I'm trading, 
what the volatility has been, how much is in my account. I, I need to hold, so they work backwards. What wealthy traders do is they say, okay, if I can risk 2% of my account, then I take the share price and I take 2% of the total amount of my account and I work backwards to determine the share size down to, okay, I'm trading Apple today, I'm a two, I can only risk 2% on this trade, therefore my share size can be 306 shares. Literally, that's how they do it. There is no guessing, there is no 500 shares. Trading 500 shares of Dean Foods at DF is a whole lot different than trading 500 shares of Apple. Okay, there should be no set position size for you. You should calculate it based on your risk and work backwards. Every trade you do is going to have to be different in terms of share size. 22. Profit targets are based on average true range or something. What, the, what this means is that same thing as setting share price. You can't just say, I'm going to make a buck on this today. All right, my average profit target is a dollar. Well, that's fine, but if something only moves typically 50 cents in a day, how are you going to make a dollar and you're a day trader? It's going to have to be based on the, tr the range of something that normally trades. What's the normal volatility? Then you work your way backwards to figure out where maybe a price level is that you see as resistance. That's the way it's determined. It's, you can't just say, I'm going to make a dollar every time or, or you know, two bucks on every trade. It doesn't work that way. 23, one or two trades a month make their month. This was kind of surprising to me. I thought, you know what? Traders just grind it out every day. And some do. A lot of the floor traders say, I ground out profits every day. But for most of the wealthy traders I talk to, they grind it out all right. And then when that one or two trades comes along, they pile on size like a monster. And that trade makes their month. Sometimes one or two trades make their year. Think about the patience that takes to wait for those one or two trades to come along. But that's the truth. When they come along and they're, they're, they're running and it does well, they pile on size like crazy and they take advantage of that sucker because they know that might be the one trade this month they're going to make their account. That was surprising to me. 24. Competent decision makers in the face of incomplete information. Now, this is where I think cops are good traders, and the reason for that is when I have a traffic stop and I'm in a high gang area and I know I'm, I'm stalking, stopping a a gang vehicle that's wanted or that is matches the description of a vehicle that was just involved in a shooting three minutes earlier, and I'm walking up to that car. I probably wouldn't walk up to that car, but is that driver reaching for a gun or is he reaching for a cell phone to call his girlfriend to tell him, tell her that he's going to be late because he just got pulled over? I have to make a decision based on incomplete information. Now, <laughs> There was the, uh, the, the idea that, that you can make good decisions even with incomplete information is a tough one, right? That's about not being comfortable all the time. I'm not always comfortable 100% out on the street because I am working with incomplete information. Do I shoot this guy because it's a gun or do I not because it's a cell phone? I've got to make that decision. So wealthy traders are comfortable. You're never going to know everything there is to know about a trade. If it's going to work out, you'll never be that confident. So you've got to be able to make a decision knowing incomplete information, and you've got to be confident in doing that. 25, a losing trade is not a reflection of themselves as a trader. If you lose, it's easy to feel badly about, ah, I'm, a, I'm not a good trader, I'm just not getting this, it's not working out for me. The market's not trying to, to put you in a bad mood. It's not a reflection of you as a person when you're, at, you're having a bad day as a trader if you're not making great decisions, if it's just not happening for you. You're going to have those days. It's not a reflection on you. Wealthy traders get past that. They step up to the plate again the next day with as much confidence as they did when they started the day before. 26. Their business isn't trading. It's finding the right trades. Full-time traders, new ones, have a tough time with this because they come from a job where you're working all day. And if you're not working, you're playing Galaga on your computer, then you're not working. Your job is not to be in trades. Your job is not to push the buy button or the sell button all day. That's not your job. Your job is to wait for the right trade to come, on, to come along and then execute on it. And does that mean you sit on your hands for five hours until that happens? That's it. You're trading. You're still a trader if you're just sitting there flat in the market and not in. Okay? I'm getting close to my time here, so we're going to move it. Just a few more. They write down or record every trade, their price, thoughts, or mood. Okay, that's part of a trading journal. 
a lot of the wealthy traders talked to, I talked to you right in there what they had for breakfast and how they felt when they got up and how much sleep they got the night before. Write as much down as you want, okay? You've got to keep a record of that because it, what traders will find out inevitably is, hey, I look back at my record, I make crappy decisions from 11 to 12. Why is that? I don't know. Maybe because I'm hungry and I'm waiting for lunch or, you know, one day to, one life to live is on and I like that show and I'm watching. I'm, I'm, whatever, whatever it is, I cannot make good trades between 11 and 12 p.m. Pacific. So guess what? I'm stopping trading at 11 a.m. Pacific and I won't pick back up until noon. You can fight it and fight it and try to figure out why you're not making good trading decisions, but the other alternative is just not to trade during that hour. But you're not going to know that unless you keep really detailed notes about times and how you felt and what you were doing and the reasoning behind your trades. 28. Their conviction on an active trade remains unless something major changes. I'm a better trader when I put in a trade, put in my profit target, put in my stop loss, and literally walk away. Because if I sit there, even though nothing has changed in the market, nothing in the market has told me that I'm, I need to do something with that trade, I start to fiddle with it. I fiddle with the profit target. I fiddle with the stop loss. I think maybe I should add more to it. Maybe I should take half off. And I didn't realize this until I had to start trading and go to meetings and things like that, and I had to walk away from it. Oh, what, oh, lo and behold, guess what? I'm, I'm making more money this past three weeks when I had to put a trade on and leave than I did sitting in front of it all day. This is where half and you know some traders are half and half. They can do it. They can sit in front of the day, uh, in front of the trade all day, and not fiddle with it. For me, I couldn't. I always wanted to fiddle with it. So they remain convicted. And if that means you have to walk away and just what happens happens, then so be it. That's the way I have to trade. Twenty-nine. A winning trade does not result in taking on extra risk the next trade. Just because you had a monster trade the time before does not mean you double your size the next time. Okay. If your trading plan does not uh, account for that, shouldn't be doing it. Every trade is, is set individually based on your trade plan. And 30, they trade the reaction, not the news. They don't trade the news of non-farm payrolls as much as they trade the reaction to the news. Some of the wealthy traders I've tried to talk to trade the reaction to the reaction. Okay, so it's not so much about the news, it's about the reaction to the news, sometimes it's the reaction to the overreaction. To the, <laughs> you, know what I mean, you know what I mean by that. So, it's not about trading news, really. What they mean is they trade the reaction to that news. Now, those are 30 things. They, some of them are more applicable to you than others. Hopefully, if one or two of them um, made sense to you or get you to think about your trading in a little bit different way, then I've done my job here. Um, so, I, I, you know, everybody's had an offer today. Here's my offer. Um, TraderInterviews.com slash links slash lifetime. We have a lifetime membership to our, our Trader Interviews that is normally $1,500. And right now we're doing it for $499, which is the same as a one year. We do a new interview every year or every month. And uh, there's 287 interviews with wealthy traders already in there. And the idea is the, of these interviews is not to teach you how to trade. It's to listen while you're on your way to work or listen on the way to, to doing whatever at the gym and go, ooh, you know what? There's something I haven't thought about. Let me think about that. You know, if you do, if you get one idea from every interview, that's the idea. And if it makes you 500 bucks, then you've made up for it. So, all right. Uh, let's see. If there's any questions, I can take questions. Um, and uh, let's see. Slides one and four seem to conflict with each other. Well, let me go back and take a look at that. See, there's four. They know exactly where they enter and one. Mm, no, not sure how that conflicts. Patient with winning, impatient with losers, and knowing both profit targets and uh, exits before you get in. Job. Uh, I'd especially like to thank all of you guys uh, that are Thanks, here. Thanks, everybody. I appreciate yeah, this it. This was actually our biggest event ever. Uh, we had, we we had our a our big event last month because, that had, um, I think, a top. I think we topped out at 1,205 people last month. And thank you. Uh, today we were somewhere around we're 1360 at one point. You know, this is this is the thing that I love about you guys. We started at uh, nine o'clock Central Time. It's now 2:30, and we've still got 827 people here. And, and here's a look at this. This is this is just amazing. Um, let me pull this up real quick and uh, pull this up and show you. But take a look at that. And that's everybody tuned in uh, from all across the globe. You know, like I said earlier, we've uh, been unable to penetrate. 
uh, the traders in Greenland. Uh, so if you know anybody that trades in Greenland, you know, tell them to log into a trading pub event. We've never had anybody there. So again, uh, but again, look, you know, great crowd today. What I'd like to do, we've got kind of kind of a little bit of a uh, interesting session uh, that we're going to do. We're just going to take a little bit of time, kind of some back and forth, and and also a lot of um, a lot of feedback from you guys in the room. Uh, Kyle, if you can, real quick, do do a quick audio test for me. Let's make sure your your mic's working. And there's. Hey, how's it going? All right, Everyone good deal. Yeah, we, we can hear you. Well, you know, you guys heard from Surge earlier of MarketFi, and um, you know, there, there's some really cool stuff going on. I know that uh, you guys have been great, uh, great attendees for Trading Pub today. And uh, you know, if you're on our newsletter, you probably heard a little bit about MarketFi, some of the stuff that we've sent out. But you know, when we started Trading Pub, and we started Trading Pub about a year and a half ago, and really our goal was basically to provide access to events like this where we can work with top traders throughout the industry, uh, provide this free education around the globe, and I think that you know we've learned a lot, uh, we've done a lot of cool things, and obviously the message is starting to get out. And the thing that we really try to do is, is focus on traders that are going to provide value. And I think that you know anytime you have this many people in a room, you know, a lot of you guys are taking time out of your Saturday to be here. We want to provide value. We want to deliver for you and make sure that you leave here knowing and learning a lot more uh, than you came with. And, and so, again, you know, we record all our events. We put them on our website and just try to, uh, try to have that tremendous value. Well, uh, interestingly enough, um, you know, earlier this year I, I came across MarketFi, and, and a lot of you guys have probably heard of Benzinga, uh, which is an outstanding website, news website. Uh, but I came across MarketFi. I said, "This is really pretty cool. It fits in very nicely, you know, with what we're trying to accomplish at the Trading Pub." And so I started talking with uh, Kenny and Kyle and some of the guys over there, and and you know, we're alerting our members about MarketFi and the cool stuff going on. And then you guys heard Surge today, you know, that did an outstanding job talking about candlesticks uh, and and so on and so forth. And so I asked Kyle. I said, Kyle. You know, we, we've got Surge coming in. This is the first time we've really had MarketFi do an event. Let's let's get you on there and talk a little bit uh, and talk a little bit about kind of the evolution of a trader, like the things that traders go through. And and first of all, Kyle, if you could just kind of give us a little glimpse. You know, a lot of these, a lot of people in here haven't had a chance to hear you before. You know, what what is your background? How did you end up at Benzinga? And then how did MarketFi come about? Yeah, absolutely, and and thanks a lot for for bringing us into this, Morgan. You know, obviously we love what's going on at Trading Pub, and I got to tell you guys, this community is just fantastic. Um, I, this is what it's about, guys. It's Saturday, you know, all the way until I'm on Eastern Time, all the way till 3:30 here, and um, I listened to a lot of the presentations today. And what you guys are developing is what it's about, and it's what we're trying to do at MarketFi. Um, and to go a little back into my uh, my history, um, you know, I'm I'm a serial entrepreneur have started um, several companies and, um, you know, got them funded and, and, and sold and stuff. And I ended up falling upon Benzinga um, very in the early days uh, when it was just being started, um, just when we were a trading idea network and we were, we were trying to create um, content that everybody could consume to figure out how to actually trade off of what was going on in the world. And um, I, I came from, a, um, I was right before that at a private uh, equity firm, VP of a private equity firm. And when we found Benzinga, um, it was pretty incredible over the evolution as we grew that website um, and grew that content because we got to talk and interact and trade alongside uh, just thousands and thousands of people. Um, and that's eventually what, um, you know, kind of kept our, our, our brain turning and, until we created MarketFi. And, and MarketFi in, in a simple form is the first ever um, marketplace for all of these products that we're talking about today, be it uh, books or be it uh, trade alert products or chat rooms or education courses and what we're trying to do is provide transparency in finding things that can help you trade right um, you know I, I, I love uh, Tim Berkwin and, and I actually just got done reading his book a couple days ago and I emailed him and I said you hit you hit the issues that the nail right on the head about why people don't make money trading and it's not about the tools or the strategies right um, I always say kiss, keep it simple, stupid. Uh, find something and start small um, and realize that you need to work on yourself with trading. And that's probably one of the biggest 
um, issues that I see. And, and, you know, we built MarketFi to help provide these products for you, um, be it that kind of psychology or, or be, it, be it the tools and strategies that you're looking at today. And obviously, I, um, you guys saw Serge Berger earlier who actually taught me how to, um, you know, trade and, and look around with charting. But um, on top of that, you know, it's the evolution. And like you said, Morgan, um, the evolution of a trader, right? And I have in big, bold letters on my notes here, um, psychology and, and literally knowing who you are and, and learning how you are going to trade, not, not trying to adapt somebody else. But um, at the same token, how do you find those tools? How do you find, um, you know, what's going to help you be successful? And that's why we created MarketFi. So, um, yeah, so if you, you, know, I can, you see it up on the screen there, uh, you know, you got a lot of different products. We're still in beta. The cool thing, and I actually, I have some people live chatting on the site with me today from this webinar. The cool thing of what we built was we're in between you and everybody, um, you and all these people that you're buying these products from. So instead of just landing on someone's site and them sharing maybe uh, their track record with you or customer testimonials, you don't know if they're true. And that's the problem with buying these products. Um, what we're doing is creating an Amazon.com type experience where there's social reviews eventually on the products and, and you can talk to the people that have bought them. Very much like what you have here going on Trading Pub, Morgan. The, um, the snake salesmen are gone. I see someone put that in there before. Um, where we spent all this money on there and, and creating a community around this kind of trading. And that's really what we're going for. So when we say transparency, um, when people trade and make trade alerts and issue these kind of newsletters on our site, uh, MarketFi, we actually built the back end just like a brokerage where we pull down all the data from the exchanges, we price check the bid and ask, and we make sure that the alerts that they're sending out have some sort of, um, like I said, verification on them for, you know, um, to make sure that, you know, you can actually follow their strategy. And it's not so much about blind stock picking, it's more about learning how they came to that rationale. Um, actually, Tim talked about this before, uh, right when he got off, and keeping a trading journal, and actually something else that we're, um, we're building next and it's going to be launched here by the end of March is where if you click into a product, you can see their portfolio. We're going to allow everybody to track that stuff for themselves. And we're, what we're trying to do is create really, really interactive and easy to use trading journals. So you can tag blog posts or YouTube videos or articles you read to that trade that you made so you can learn from it because that's how you truly learn how to be better at trader is, you know, constantly analyzing and analyzing what you're doing. Um, and then analyzing if I made, um, you know, 1,000 trades in 2012 and here's the ones that I lost. And like Tim said, you realize all of a sudden I'm losing these types of trades. You know, maybe if, I'm a, um, uh, if I look at entries off of charting, a certain kind of candle is the one that keeps screwing me up. Maybe it's the shooting star and you can analyze how to be a better trader. So that's what we're all about, Morgan. I know that was kind of a, <laughs> a long-winded answer to your, your question there, but um, Be good, kind of, and, kind of and you know, I think you. one of the things that uh, Kyle touched on, and I think that uh, that everybody here in the room would agree uh, on, is that trading's not an easy thing, and so you know it takes time. But but one thing that I've found is you can learn, and and you guys probably saw this. You know, we had some great traders in here today sharing different methods. They all trade differently. Um, they all look at the market differently. But I think you can learn from everybody, and so really, it's kind of kind of a way that pieces that together. Um, and, and this is kind of cool. I actually, um, and, and this is something I do personally and, and with Trading Pub is with a lot of the stuff, with a lot of the people that you have on here, I don't just kind of, uh, you know, go to Google and type in, you know, trading person and, and try to get them on here, but I actually try this stuff out. And, and so I, um, Kyle, I don't know if you know this, if I've told you this, but I had signed up for Tim, uh, Tim Bigham's uh, service on, on MarketFi, and so we had our first trade last week it was a caterpillar trade bought um bought the hundred dollar put the march put and and here's here's the cool thing is is that there's lots of services out there and if i were to come and tell you if i were to come and tell you hey and and this is what what tim did basically he bought uh the march caterpillar 100 put at 365 and the trade and then he sold it a couple days later at 390 so so had a nice gain now if I have a signal service and I tell you, hey, I'm buying CAT at 365, and then a couple days later I say, hey, I sold CAT at 390, you know, yes, you made the trade, yes, you made money, but what did you learn from it? And and kind of one of the cool things is is that uh, each day on the, like Kyle mentioned with the blog post, Tim went through and, and talked about what the market was doing. He said, hey, you know, it rallied the next day, so he said, you know, I'm going to look for an opportunity. I might look at hedging this with a spread. And, and it's just cool to kind of take you through 
uh, the mindset. So, so Kyle, talk a little bit about that, how you guys are incorporating, where it's not just a signal service, but really, you know, the education that comes along with the trading. So, so can you talk a little bit about how that, how that, Yeah, and that's that's what's so important to us, right? Um, when we were sitting here building this um, this platform, and like I said, all of these people, are, and we're continually to add more and more traders onto the site. And actually, everybody that just listened to Daryl, we're planning on ad adding a lot of his binaries education to the site as well. It, it we were we were so sick of the uh, the newsletters back in the day because you'd get an email and then you'd sit there and have to have your own conviction, and you were alone. And we just felt like that was a poor way to teach people how to trade strat different strategies. So, you know, Morgan, that Caterpillar trades a perfect example. Tim, Tim will do a webinar every other week that he teaches um, exactly what he's looking at. And he uses Bollinger Bands to um, spot opportunities inside of trades um, or to get into trades. And then not only will he issue the alerts and talk about them, and you can see on the feed right here um, as Morgan's picking it up, He'll take a look at the trade with you, and then all of a sudden there's a community a community discussion around what's going on across every single point. So it's almost like getting inside of Tim's trading journal, right? Um, going back to that, getting inside his trading journal and learning along the way with him, and he'll post videos and blog posts, and then Marketify tracks and, and, and verifies all these trades for you. But it's it, you get to learn alongside him, right? Why do you make that entry? Now, maybe you don't make the trade alongside him, but you get to watch it with them, and and you can see his rationale and his his mindset all every single step of the way. And now Tim trades options, um, and that's just one type of product on there. And, and there's several several others right now. But it's all about you know now now working on yourself as a trader, working on that psychology, working on becoming better disciplined, and 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 now adding more tools. Tim's another tool. Tim teaches you how to use Bollinger Bands um, and uh, the RSI indicator to spot opportunities. And not only that, manage a trade after you make the entry. Um, you know, I'm going to reference Tim's book again because it's so great, but he talks about risk management, right, and position sizing um, and walking away from a trade and, and learning how to do that. Um, and I think that's so important of this kind of solution that we built is um, the stock picking of the day. And, you know, someone in the actual chat said, um, um, talking about the snake oil salesman back in the day, and there are, you know, those are the ones that are still out there today. It's just because uh, Rick, you just came in, uh, Tim Berkwin, his book. I was right reference his him book. I, I know we're talking about two different Tims right now. Um, the, the snake salesmen were there because we couldn't, um, we couldn't verify them, and, and we, we were trying to buy tools from them, and that's what we're trying to provide now, right? Give that transparency to everybody and get a community around trading, and you can get better. You know, I got some notes written here. That doesn't mean trading's easy, and, and people will buy these services, and I'm constantly teaching everyone. Um, just because you buy the service doesn't mean you're automatically going to make money overnight. That That's not the way the markets work. It, it takes time. It takes a lot of time to become better at, um, better at trading. But you start small. You start learning. You find people that are applicable to you, and that's why you guys are all here today. You, you find people that are applicable to you and what you're trying to do. Maybe you're... Um, you know, you, ha you can only trade the first hour of the day, or maybe you're a swing trader. That's, that's what I am. Um, but then once you find that, now you got to continually work at it and get better and, and not look at losing trades badly, but look at it as, okay, how do I make sure I, I manage at risk? Um, I, I keep, keep my stop losses um, and, so that when I, I, I get a winner, I'm allowed to let it run. And, and obviously, hopefully those outweigh weigh the ones you lost. So. Um, yeah, so this is definitely um, one of the ways that we're trying to do it with MarketFi. Now, this is a trade alert product. We also have education courses. Uh, we also have uh, chat rooms, and we also have, uh, right now we only have one, and um, what we have the uh, capability of live trading rooms. Uh, we're going around now meeting people like Morgan and meeting people um, like Serge Berger, who you heard from earlier, and, and we're, act we're constantly adding new products to the site. They have to go through a 30-day vetting period, though. Where we actually trade with them in real uh, in real time, uh, whatever their strategy is, or we go through their education, or we sit in on a chat room um, to make sure that before the product's offered on the marketplace, that it's worth value. Like you know, not not saying it's going to make your money, right? Because um, not not there's no guarantee in that kind of, kind of talk or, or in that life. But we make sure that yes, there's there's a lot of value from this trader. Um, he or she knows really really what they're doing, and, and it's um, something that people can learn from. Um, so that's kind of the process of what we're doing at Marketify right now in, in terms of when we get products on. 
And then, um, uh, like I said, lastly, it's, you know, if you're not keeping a trading journal right now, if you take one thing away from today, if you're not keeping a trading journal, start on Monday, okay? Start on Monday because that's how you're gonna you're gonna learn to become better a better trader and, and evolve. All right, uh, yeah, like good, good advice. Uh, and the, the, the um, uh, I'll get yeah, a great, uh, great advice, already, Colin. One wait, thing that's interesting. Wait. Sometimes you know I've I've talked to people before where they say, hey, I'm struggling with trading. You know, what should I do? I haven't done it, and and Tim mentioned it, Kyle mentioned it, but if you don't know, well, I think um, basically. Okay, there. Can you hear us now? Hey Everybody guys, can you now? hear me okay. still? I think typed in that link. That's for um, Surge's product. So basically, you see here, if you click that link, uh, it'll take you there. But uh, Kyle, I think you were going to do something too, just to let anybody, basically any product they want to choose. You had some kind of special offer. Can you talk about that? Uh, let people uh, kind of get their toe in the water with Market Five. Yeah, so um, when you go to the site, you will see that um, when you go to marketify.com slash store, you can check out um, and, and actually filter just by the trade alert products. And if you filter by the trade alert products, we're giving 85% off of the first month to any of them with the code TRADEPUB. Um, and one of the, you know, everything has a 30-day money-back guarantee as well, but uh, one of the things we like to do is allow you to actually view and, and touch a product um, without making you know a longer term or a full price commitment or anything like that either. So if you go to the site and you filter down by trade alert products, any trade alert products, use the coupon code TRADEPUB at the checkout page and you'll actually get 85% off. Um, you can also view every single past trade or um, in the P&L and important statistics like win, win ratio and stuff um, on the products as well before you actually purchase them. Um, but if you you go to any of them, you'll you'll be able to get them for eighty five percent off. So um, make sure to check that out. And if you have any questions, we got a bunch of people in the live chat um, that'll that'll be able to assist you as well. So feel free to come in. Let us know what you're looking for too. Good deal. Well, and thanks again, Kyle. I appreciate first. you being here, and, um, and uh, really excited about what everything that you're doing with Market Fi. Um, and we'll definitely definitely be doing more with you guys in the future. So uh, you guys can check it out. We just made a link, a, a quick link. It's uh, basically if you go to tradingpub.com slash market five and then uh, use the coupon code like Kyle said it's a coupon code of trade pub so again I'll type that in for you but coupon code of trade pub we did record we'll get the recording out to everybody and again look forward to uh, seeing all you guys on the flip side